Well, good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Welcome, everybody here in person and watching us online. Thank you for hanging out with us this morning. We are in week two of our series called Deeper. Say deeper. Deeper. We're going to go deeper. Notice there's not a tagline on this series, right? Sometimes we put a tagline on there. It's not deeper, diving deeper to the depths of deeper, deep faith, deeply. (laughs) Right? We didn't add a tagline because it turns out deeper isn't always more complex. Sometimes we make going deeper with God more complex, but so often, really, when we look at God's word, he makes it pretty simple. He makes it pretty simple, but unfortunately, we tend to think that simple and easy are sometimes the same thing, and it's not. Simple and easy are not the same thing. I'll give you some examples this morning. So we want to go deeper in our faith with God, right? We're going to read our Bible more. We're going to spend time in prayer. We're going to dedicate time. We're going to put time out of our schedule. That's simple, right? We just schedule it. That's simple. But then guess what? What happens? Life happens. The kids got practice. We take on a new project at work. And so all of a sudden, the time that I had put aside for that, now it's, I got other things I got to do with that time. It's simple, but it's not always easy. Tithing, giving our 10% back to God. You don't have to have a mathematics major to figure out 10% of your income and give it back to God. It's a trust issue. And that's why it's not always easy, right? It doesn't feel like it's easy. It's simple to give 10% to God, but is it easy? There's things in this world we want to put our money towards, right? There's other things that we want to spend our money on, and it ends up taking away from that that we're supposed to be giving to God at times. It's simple, but it's not always easy. Another thing, just trusting God, right? God is omniscient. He's omnipresent. He is omnipotent. He's everywhere. He's all-powerful, and he knows everything. That's a guy we can trust, right? That's simple. It's simple. Just trust him. But it's not always easy. It's not always easy. It's because there's, there's conflicting voices everywhere around us, right? There's, there's things that get our attention and we start listening to that rather than listening to what we know God is, who we know God is. We get distracted because this world is full of distractions, right? Anybody agree? It's full of distractions. It's kind of like the time that we took our students to castles and coasters, Okay, we were on the bumper cars and I was caught up in the fun, having a great old time doing bumper cars with the students. And I got caught up in the fun and I couldn't hear the ride operator who was the voice of authority in that moment because I was all caught up in the fun. And I ended up getting kicked off the bumper cars. I actually have it on video. So check this out. I know you'll enjoy it. Got the gathering... Bumper car extravaganza. It's going to be amazing. What up? It's literally everyone from the gathering. I don't know how that happened. Oh, we're on. Here we go. Um, oh, here I go. Oh, here I go. Oh, yeah. Come on, Jane. That really hurt my shin. I'm coming at you. Get out of my way. How you doing? Not again! Oh, I can't hear you over the whole thing. I've been just saying it multiple times. <laughs> okay, that's fine. So let me just say, I have repented for breaking the rules of casters and coasters. But in the spirit of authenticity, that's not how that ended. I look like I'm totally okay being kicked off the bumper cars, but I did let the 16-year-old girl that I thought her rules were dumb. Uh, and I've, I've since realized that I shouldn't have done that, okay? And, and I've repented for that. But my appeal did work, okay? My appeal did work. I was sentenced to 60 minutes in timeout, okay? But after my appeal... After my appeal, I was granted uh, 15 minutes with good time. When Riley got off the ride, the the girl said, come here, come here, come here. Tell that guy he can come back in 15 minutes. (laughs) Oh, man, but that's the world we live in. It's distracting, right? We're going to be in John chapter 6 today. We're actually continuing the story from last week. Uh, Last week, I had no clue uh, that Pastor John was going to teach on Mark chapter 6. I had started working on John chapter 6, and it's 
it just continues the story right where Pastor John left off. And I didn't know he was going to do that. So it's actually really cool how when we just get out of the way, sometimes the Holy Spirit can just drive the, the, what he wants to communicate to us this morning. But I have a question. Would anyone in this room be surprised to hear that there was a point in Jesus's ministry where some of his disciples, in fact, it says many of his disciples turned and walked away and they stopped following Jesus. You know what the reason was? Because the teaching got hard. The teaching got hard. Turn to your neighbor this morning and say, the teaching got hard. If you're watching us online, type it in the chat. The teaching got hard. John chapter six, we're gonna go to the very end, verse 60. It says this, on hearing it, hearing what? Deeper teaching. Many of his disciples said, this is hard teaching. Who can accept it? Verse 66, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. The title of this message today is When the Teaching Got Hard. And the question that I've been wrestling with and I want us to wrestle with today, I've been wrestling with it all week, is, is growing deeper in our relationship with God, is that, should that be an option in our life? Should that be something that's optional for us as Christians or should that be a biblical expectation, a godly expectation that we have in our lives to grow deeper in our faith, to grow deeper in our relationship with God? I mean, let's face it, in our normal lives, we don't settle for shallow, right? You you don't go out and get a, a, a minimum wage job flipping burgers, and then expect to raise your family on that job. And how many, how many people in here have retired from a minimum wage job? We, we excel, right? We exceed. We want to do a little bit more. We, we go deeper. We learn a little bit extra. We maybe do some, some uh, additional training in our, in our field, right? Because we want to go deeper. But some of us today are just okay having a minimum wage relationship with Jesus. And then we wonder why we feel spiritually bankrupt. I've been there. I know how that feels. And friends, if you're feeling spiritually bankrupt today, I wanna tell you that there is hope this morning for you, for me, for all of us, because Jesus is in this place. And in him and through him, there is a provision that will last through eternity for you and I spiritually today. I wanna challenge us to be willing to accept that and go deeper today in our relationship with Jesus. We're going to look at John, we're going to, uh, chapter 6, starting in verse 25. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, you were looking for me not because you signed the, saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life which the son of man will give you for on him. God, the father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this to believe in the one he has sent to believe in the one he has sent. God, I just thank you for this opportunity to come together and study your word together this morning. God, I pray that as we dig deeper into this, God, that you would just unlock the, the, the portion of us that needs to go deeper, that, that we would just accept that. We would set, accept all of you today so that we can go deeper and deeper in our relationship with you. We love you in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, point number one this morning is this. Deeper believes deeper. Deeper believes deeper. Verse 28, what must we do to do the works of, that God requires? That's what the multitude asked him. What works do we need to do? They want a list. Tell us what we need to do. Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to simply believe in the one he has sent. Jesus is so smart. I mean, I know that's like a duh statement. But they ask him, what works do we need to do? And Jesus takes it all, just boils it all down into one thing, believe. Believe. If you want to go deeper in your relationship with God today, the starting point is simply to believe. Believe in him deeper. Trust in him deeper. Put your faith and your trust in Jesus today. That's the starting point for growing deeper. Friends, God wants our trust. 
That's what he wants from us. He wants us to trust him. If you really want to please God in your life, trust him. Trust him and follow. Be obedient to the will that he has for your life. We have to trust him deeper, not know him deeper. Listen, knowledge is, is not spiritual growth. It can be, knowledge can come with spiritual growth. It can be a byproduct of spiritual growth. But friends, you can know and never grow. You can know and never grow because it's up here and it doesn't come down to your heart and it never takes root and you never end up growing. Just this past week, Pastor John and I had lunch uh, with uh, Mike right back there. And uh, we were sitting at Jim's Burger and Eggs. We're having a great conversation with Mike, kind of hearing his story. And uh, we were so distracted, weren't we? Yeah, we were distracted. Why? Because over to our right, there's another table and there's two guys there that are having the deepest theological debate and like argument ever. And we're sitting here and we're trying to listen to Mike and like, tell us your story. We're trying to pull it out of him. And all of us, all three of us are going, you know, like we're getting pulled over. You're laughing because you know it's true. And we're like, man. And you know what? I sat there and I was just so grieved because they're having this theological argument. And I'm like, oh man, there's a place for that. There is absolutely a place for that. But Jesus didn't die so that he could be the topic of a theological debate 2,000 years later. He wants us to have a deep relationship with him. He wants us to know him and grow with him. That's what Jesus wants for our life. Friends, deeper isn't knowing more about Jesus. It's knowing Jesus more. That's what deeper looks like. He wants a deeper, more intimate relationship with us all today because deeper believes deeper. Now, our story begins in verse 25. The multitude has found him physically, right? Verse 25, when they found him on the other side of the lake, they find him physically, but they haven't caught up with him spiritually. They found him physically, but not spiritually. Now I wanna give you some background. Verse 25 says, on the other side of the lake. This is kind of what Pastor John talked about last week. I've got a map, and there's four cities on this map that I want you to to take a look at. Up in the top uh, right corner, is a Bethsaida, okay, so keep that in mind. Remember where that's at. Over to the left is Capernaum, remember where that's at. And then down south, you see where Tiberius is. We're gonna talk about Tiberius, so it's important to remember where Tiberius is. And then over to the far left in the bottom corner, you see the city of Nazareth. We're gonna talk about those four places today. So background, here's what happened. There was a miracle on the other side of the lake, right? Jesus feeds the 5,000. He uses five barley loaves and two fishes. He does that over at Bethsaida. Immediately, Pastor John talked about last week, immediately after he does this miracle, he sends his disciples to get in the boats and head to the other side. And he goes up on the mountain to pray, right? The disciples, they head out later that night. They're straining at the oars. There's a storm. Jesus sees them. He walks on the water. He goes out and he approaches them. Now, John's account says that they were frightened. They were frightened when they saw him. And according to Mark, it's because they thought he was a ghost. We talked about that last week. But Jesus says, it is I. Do not worry. And then John says that they were willing to let Jesus get into the boat. Why? Because that fear had been subsided. Because they, in that moment, believed deeper. And they allowed Jesus into the boat. Then it says that immediately, say immediately, immediately immediately the boat wound up on the other side. Now it doesn't say that it was a miracle, but that sounds like a miracle to me. Here they were, they're straining at the oars. And when they were willing to let Jesus in their boat, they got to where they needed to go. Friends, if you need God to move in your life today, maybe we just need to let him in the boat. Maybe we just need to be willing to let him in the boat this morning. Because when, he, when they needed that boat to move, it moved as soon as they let Jesus in the boat. So the next morning, they get to the other side. The next morning, the multitude, they wake up, right? They wake up. They're in Bethsaida. They realize Jesus isn't here. The disciples isn't here. Yesterday, the night before, there was only one boat. And we saw the disciples get in it. There's no more boats. So where's Jesus? They start looking for Jesus. Then the Bible says something really interesting. And I, I just love little geeky facts like this. It says that boats show up from Tiberias. Remember, we looked way down south. Boats show up from Tiberias. And that's just further uh, proving the fact that there was a storm the night before, 
right? There's a storm the night before and it would have broken loose some boats and here come the boats. And so there they are, they wake up and here come their boats. And so they get in the boats, they go across to the other side to Capernaum. And that's where this story is, uh, starts, right? But, but let me ask a question. Why, why did they go through all that trouble? Why did they get in the boats to go find Jesus? I'll tell you why. Because they wanted the wonder bread. They wanted the wonder bread, right? They wanted Jesus for his provision. They wanted Jesus for his provision. Are there times in our life where where really that's why we want Jesus is because he's our provider. We just want Jesus to provide for us. We're like Christina Aguilera, right? There's a genie in the bottle. Okay? And, and And we treat Jesus like that sometimes. You know, there's a student. He's actually here today in a small group this last Wednesday night. He raised his hand very bravely and said one of the most, asked one of the most honest questions I've ever heard a teenager ask. And he goes, does anybody else feel like the only time they pray is when they need something? So I assured him he was the only person that felt that way. (laughs) We prayed for him. No, no, I was like, yeah, dude, all of us, right? Baylor, we were there. We're like, yeah, yeah, that's, we've been there, man. And that's exactly where the people are here. In fact, Jesus tells them that in verse 27. He says, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life. He's saying, don't just come to me for the wonder bread. Just don't, don't come to me for the wonder bread, wonder bread. And Jesus is saying the same thing to you and I today. He's saying, don't work for things that spoil on this earth. Work for the things that are going to endure. They're going to take you through to eternity. The multitude didn't realize that Jesus was on an earthly mission with heavenly objectives. He didn't re- they didn't realize that. And friends, we need to realize that today. We are on an earthly mission with heavenly objectives, with eternal objectives. There are heavenly implications on the mission that we've been sent on today. We all have a purpose and we all have a plan. God wants us to play our part. Let's continue verse 30. So they asked him, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Right? They're trying to bait him. They're like, we're hungry. Give us the bread. We're, we're trying to bait him. It, he goes, they go on. Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread to eat. They're going, come on, give us the bread. Give us the bread. Give us the wonder bread. We're hungry. Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who gave them the bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they answer, sir, always give us this bread. But see, (laughs) they're still talking about this bread. They, They haven't gone deeper yet. They're not understanding that Jesus is trying to get them to see deeper. They're talking about wonder bread, wonder bread. And Jesus declares, verse 35, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. In fact, in the book of John, there are seven times, there are seven statements that Jesus makes where he says, I am. And they're this, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the vine. Friends, if there's someone here today who's going, I don't know who this Jesus is, that's who Jesus is. That's who Jesus is. And he was, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's who Jesus is today. Jesus goes on. He says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never go thirsty. But as I told you, you've seen me and you still do not believe. They still don't believe. Jesus is trying to get them to to believe beyond the bread. Believe beyond the bread. And remember, we we have to see this story through the lens of the miracle that happened on the other side. This is the same multitude that saw Jesus feed them. So everything they see is is through this lens of Jesus can provide for me. Jesus can give me the bread. But can we go deeper just for a second? It's okay if we 
if I teach on this for just a minute? Because it, it, this rocked me when I realized it. Who remembers what kind of bread the little boy had? Barley. Barley bread. And you know, in that time, barley wasn't even really fit for human consumption. It was peasant food. A lot of times they fed the animals barley. And yet, not only were they chasing Jesus after his provision, they were chasing after a provision that wasn't even fit for them. It was a provision that that they had had that really, truly wasn't something that was going to sustain. It was a a provision that they, they could do better than that. But yet they chased all the way across the Sea of Galilee for a provision. Man, how many times do we chase things in our life that aren't fit for us? How many times do we chase things in our life that that we end up going, I need that, I need that, I need that, but it's just not fit for us. Jesus is trying to get us to understand, to see beyond the bread, to believe beyond the bread today. Jesus wants us to see beyond that bread. He wants us to believe beyond what we see physically. He wants us to believe beyond that limitation that we've put on our life. He wants us to believe beyond a lie that's been spoken over your life to believe beyond your, your best excuses. Believe beyond the storms that you're in today. Believe beyond that because our God wants to take us deeper. And in order to go deeper with God, we have to know that it starts with belief. It starts with placing our trust in him because deeper believes deeper. Point number two, deeper denies self. Verse 37, all those the father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my father's will is that everyone who looks to the son and believes in him shall have eternal life and I will raise them up at the last day. We have to remember that this is the same crowd that after that miracle, Pastor John talked about it last week, they wanted to take Jesus as their earthly king. If by force, if necessary, that's what they wanted. They wanted an earthly king and they wanted the provision, right? They wanted earthly provision. They wanted earthly provision. Come be our king. Jesus, just be our king. And and Jesus being fully man and yet fully God, the the fully man part of him was being tempted to be an earthly king. And I mean, how great would that be, right? Be an earthly king, have all that power on earth. But you know something? That's not the first time that Jesus was tempted to be an earthly king. Did you know that? Happened in the desert. Matthew 4, 8 says that the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. He is surrounded by thousands of people who would love to make him king right now. But this is so cool because here's the thing. Jesus first denied self in private before he denied self in public. Jesus was the same person in private that he was in public. Jesus was alone with Satan. It's the lonely place to be, but he denied himself. Satan said, I'll give you all this. So why was it easy? It was easy for him to say, no, of course he's fully God, but the man portion of Jesus, he had already been there and he had already made up his mind. He'd already decided that's not for me. We can all learn from that today to be the same person in private than we are in public. The Jewish people, they they start to hear his teaching and they start to get upset in verse 42. They say, is this not Jesus, son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I've come down from heaven? That's a fair question, right? Remember I I showed you where Nazareth was on the map? They're in Capernaum. It's only 40 miles. It's only 40 miles between the two spots. So he, he could be surrounded by some high school buddies or something, right? I mean, people that he grew up with, they know Mary and Joseph, and they're saying, how can he say he came down from heaven? This is, this is Jesus from Nazareth. He's not from heaven. 
his response, I love it. Verse 43, he says, stop grumbling. Just stop grumbling. Knock it off. Right? Just knock it off. And then, he, and then he keeps teaching. 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. And I will raise them up at the last day. Now that verse is kind of an interesting verse. It's kind of an interesting verse because it says that God's the one that draws people to Jesus. Now there may be some of us, maybe all of us today who have a loved one or, or a child or a best friend or somebody that we've prayed for, we've witnessed to over and over and over again and they're just not, they're not getting it. They don't, they don't accept it, right? And you may be carrying the burden of like, oh, I want, I'm trying to get them, but they just won't. This verse can help to set us free from that burden today. Because it's not you or me that draws people to Jesus. It's the Father that draws people to Jesus. But we have to be careful. <laughs> we have to balance that. And here's why. What's the primary way that God draws people to him? Through other people. We get to play a part in that. We can't just wake up and go, well, God is omniscient. He knows everything that's going to happen today. And so there's nothing I can do to impact the world. There's nothing I can do to surprise God today. So I'll just you know, go through my life. No, if that's true, God is omniscient. But, it, but, if, but if the part where he doesn't use us is true, we just wasted four weeks on a series called Nudge, right? Where we respond to those nudges of the Holy Spirit. God uses our free will choices to play a part in drawing people to Jesus. So we have to play our part. That's where our responsibility ends. We do our part. We are obedient. And then God does his part, which is to draw them to him. But we also have to be careful with that portion of it too, because the Bible talks about something in 2 Corinthians about being yoked together, right? Being equally yoked. And at times, this is the number one question that comes up in students, by the way, I'll have a student come up to me and I'll go, um, Pastor Michael, Pastor Michael. Uh, so there's this girl and she really likes me. And, um, and I really like her. And um, she's cool. She talks to me. She's funny. She's so hot. Like, she, dude, you wouldn't even believe how hot she is. <laughs> but there's just, there's just one thing. There's just one, one little teensy thing. She doesn't believe in God. But, t- but, but hey, Pastor Michael, I believe that God has put me in her life so that I can save her. Right? I, that, that's why God put her in my life. So, I, so t- it's okay, I can date her, right? And my response always is, let's get them saved. <laughs> Bring them on in, let's get them saved, and then we can worry about maybe dating them, or, or even better yet, let's get them saved, and then let's just wait for who God brings to, to you to be your perfect mate in life. Right? We have to be careful. We have to make sure that we are equally yoked. There's a great verse, 1 Corinthians 15, 33. It says, bad company corrupts good character. We have to be careful. I think this is an original. I don't know. I didn't, I didn't find it anywhere, but I'm going to say it this way. Some people we can joke with, but we don't want to yoke with. <laughs> you like that one, don't you? Don't want to yoke with. And you know what? We're going to illustrate this verse. Okay. We're going to, we're going to illustrate this verse. Gavin and Skyla, come on up here. I got Gavin and Skyla. Let's give him a hand. All right, put that verse back up there. Bad company corrupts good character. All right, so Gavin, take a seat on this stool. You are good character, okay? He's following the Lord. He's doing everything right in life. And then there's Skyla. <laughs> ah, we do know, yeah, there's no surprise. Then there's Skyla. And Skyla, you know, she, she's not a believer. She's got some, some kind of some bad stuff going on in her life. But Gavin's like, I want to date her. I like her. And I'm going to save her. I want to illustrate this. Skyla, sit, sit down right where you are. Right, right there. Sit down. All right, so here's Gavin's plan. Gavin is like, I'm bringing her up to where I am. I'm going to bring her up to where I am. Let's see what happens. Skyla, I want you to reach up with both hands. Gavin, grab her hands. Just one hand. Yep. Here, scoot closer. Scoot closer. All right. Now, you're going to pull her up as hard as you can. Use both hands. Yeah, there you go. And I want you to pull down as hard as you can. Okay? Ready? Go. (laughs) It's not going to happen. 
It's no matter how hard you pull, it's not going to happen. And in fact, when I did it with Aaron, she pulled me off the seat. <laughs> you guys can go down. But, that, but I want, that's, the, that's the verse, right? In an illustration. Bad company corrupts good character. He's never going to pull her up to where he needs to be. She's going to end up pulling him down. And that's why it's so important that we remember that this morning. All right, I want to close with this thought today. I'm going to close with this thought. And, and before, before I give you the thought, I just want to be honest with you. I, I tried several different ways to figure out how to paraphrase this last text. Okay? I tried several different ways to even maybe just tell you a little bit about it. Every time I tried, God like hit me upside the head. He was like, stop trying to, <laughs> we're going deeper. <laughs> we're going deeper. Somebody needs to hear this today. The thought is this, deeper gives life. Deeper gives life. Verse 47. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give, to, give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply amongst themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. And so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate the manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Mm. That kind of got intense, right? I mean, eating flesh and drinking blood, kind of got intense. And you can understand why some of the people in verse 52 said, how can this man give, give us his flesh to eat? What is he talking about? What is Jesus saying? Why, why is he teaching this way? To boil that all down, he just wants us to accept every part of him. He wants us to accept all of him. He wants us to willingly accept him. Just like the disciples, when they were willingly, when they willingly allowed him to get in the boat, that's when the breakthrough happened. Jesus wants us to willingly accept him today. And I love that he didn't compromise the message. I love that he didn't compromise the message. He didn't soften the language to be more seeker friendly. I mean, come on, eat flesh and drink blood. It's like zombie church or something. (laughs) He didn't didn't soften it. And when we come to Jesus, it's simply that. It's just to come, to, to, to leave something and to go toward something else. That's what Jesus wants us to do. It, it's not complicated. It's not complicated. Just leave what we're doing and come toward him. But he doesn't want us to come unwillingly. We're not being drugged to Jesus. He wants us to come willingly and not with the wrong intentions. And that's what he's telling people here. And this is amazing. A few verses later, John 6, 64, Jesus had known from the beginning which one of them did not, which, which of them did not believe and who would betray him. So even though he knew that he wasn't gonna reach everybody, he didn't change his message, right? And that's important. There there are some students in our ministry right now that are struggling with some things that in, in an effort to love them, maybe we could soften the message a little bit. In an effort to love them, maybe we could, you know, we're here to love you and, and but we don't do that. We wanna be honest with them in love. We have to be honest to each other today. We don't just change the, 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 the teaching because of the audience, and Jesus didn't do that either. Even though he knew that, he, that there were some that wouldn't believe, he never tried to convince them. He never tried to, you know, oh, but, th- but this is good. And, uh, no, he just left with his message. 
He just stuck with his message and let God do the work. Okay, I'm really closing now. So last week, Mickey comes to me. I love Mickey. He just turned five, okay? I love Mickey. Mickey came to me and uh, he said, Daddy, would you, uh, would you make me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? And I said, sure, I'll make you a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Like, you, you got the right guy. So here's, here's you know, you gotta, I, I know peanut butter and jelly, okay? I know peanut butter and jelly. So here's, here's the bread. You got to start with the right kind of bread, which, you know, is wonder bread apparently. And then you got to pick the right kind of peanut butter, which uh, I know choosy moms choose Jif, but picky dads pick Peter Pan. So there's that. And, uh, and you got you to gotta go with the squeeze jelly. It just makes things simple, right? So got a little peanut butter on there for him. We're good. I'll stick that right there. And then a little bit of jelly. And he's right here. He's watching me do it. He can't wait, right? He's so excited. So we do this and put it on a plate for him. And he's standing there. And I'm like, here you go, buddy. Here's your, here's your sandwich. And he looks at me like I'm stupid. Like, I, like I've just handed him something like... He doesn't say anything. He just looks at me funny. And I'm like, what's, what's wrong, dude? And he goes, uh, Daddy, I don't, I don't eat the crust. He goes, I don't, I don't eat the crust. And so I'm like, all right. So I, I take it off the plate. And I'm like, fine. And I'm a little frustrated just because like, I made a perfect PB at J. So I'm like, all right. So here's the deal, Mickey. I'm going to cut this off for you. But listen, you got to eat the crust, bud. Like the crust is the best part. You know, at some point in your life, going to have to eat the crust. At some part in, in your life, you can't be a 30-year-old who goes at the restaurant, like, I'll take a BLT on sourdough. Could you have the chef cut the crust off for me? Like, <laughs> you can't do that, right? And as soon as I said that, at some point, you got to eat the crust. God spoke to me and he said, when are you going to eat the crust? How many times do we cut the parts of Jesus off that we don't really want to deal with, right? The parts of Jesus that, that maybe stretch us, that, that challenge us. We want the grace. We want the mercy. We want the love. We want the provision. But the challenge part, uh, I'm going to cut that off for a while. We have to eat the crust, friends. At some point, we have to eat the crust. We got to eat the crust. We keep cutting off the crusts in our life and then we wonder why we're spiritually starving. God intended on us to eat all of him, every part, every part of him today. I told you I was close and I didn't lie. <laughs> Listen, God, Jesus wants us to go deeper with him and accept all of him today. Okay, in him and in him alone, there is spiritual food, that will last until eternity. We'll never go hungry. We'll never be thirsty. We just need to accept all of him, even the crust, even the crust, and go into deeper waters with him today. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this teaching today. I thank you, Jesus, for, for how you taught this, God. God, I, I thank you for the way that you, you, you laid this out, that, that going deeper with you isn't necessarily this crazy complex thing. God, we, we want to go deeper with you today. I thank you for the, the, the teaching here and that and it all just, it starts with believing in you. Just believing and trusting you in a new and a deeper way today. This morning, I want to pray for two groups of people. Maybe, maybe you know Jesus, but you've never grown with Jesus, right? Maybe, maybe you know Jesus, but, but you've never stepped out. You've never put your faith and trust fully into him. Maybe, maybe you're tired of feeling spiritually bankrupt spiritually starved because there are parts of parts of Jesus that, that you just have cut out. If that's you today, just so I know who I'm praying for, we you just raise your hand up? Just say, I want to eat all of Jesus today. I want everything that Jesus has for my life. I pray for you. God, you see these hands are not raising it for me, but they're raising it to you, God. God, help uh, work through the lives of those who have raised their hand here in person and online that say, I want to go deeper in my relationship with you today. I want to know you in a deeper way. I want the full uh, provision. I want all the bread. I want everything that you have for me, God. And I'm going to trust you deeper beginning today. In Jesus' name. I also want to pray, if you've never made the decision to make Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life, 
I wanna give you that opportunity today. If you say, I want to know this Jesus, I want him to be the Lord of my life. Would you just slip your hand up boldly right now, all throughout the room. If you don't know Jesus and you wanna make him the Lord and savior of your life today. Okay, if you've raised your hand, if you're watching us online, just say a simple prayer like this. God, I'm a sinner in need of a savior. Please come into my life. Today, I make a decision to follow you, to start on this path, believing in you, putting my faith in you. I wanna follow you the rest of my life. I wanna learn how to know you deeper. And I make that decision to start that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give God a hand. Let's give God praise this morning. Friends, I want to thank you. If you made that decision, stop by our Connect Center. If it's a first-time guest, stop by our Connect Center. If you're watching us online, type it in the chat. Say, I made that decision today. This week, as you go, I challenge you, go deeper with God and accept everything that he has for you this morning. Amen? Love you guys. Thank you. Have a great week.